in the American West take on the Toronto Blue Jays in the American League East. Toronto comes in with a record of 28 and 22, tied with the New York Yankees for second place in the American League East. They are three games back, and of course the Angels 26 and 20. Let's check out the starting lineup that the Blue Jays will show tonight. And leading things off will be Devon White, the center fielder. Batting second is Roberto Alomar, the second baseman. Hitting third is Paul Molitor. The designated hitter who's hitting 342 this year in the four spot Joe Carter 13 home runs already this season John Olrood bats fifth he's the first baseman Ed Sprague who had a big home run to help the Jays beat Oakland yesterday we be batting sixth then it's Darren Jackson the right fielder Pat Borders the catcher and Domingo Cedeno is the shortstop batting ninth and on the mound for California is John Farrell yeah, John Farrell sat out the last couple of seasons because of elbow surgery, and this year he's coming back. His ERA's in the fives. He's still trying to find his rhythm of a couple of years ago, but basically he's a sinker slider type guy, uh, has a good moving fastball, likes to run it in on right-hander's fist, and he has come up with a changeup, which, which he's using a lot more this year. And I would imagine, Fred, he has to relearn how to pitch. I mean, after two years off, he had some rough beginnings, in the month of April, but his last three games, he has pitched well. Yeah, it's going to take a while for a sinker baller to get the feel again. You know, these guys don't overpower you, although he can get the ball up in that 90 mile an hour range, but he has to locate the ball very well to be successful. He has to keep the ball down, induce a lot of ground balls to be successful. For John Farrell, his last really good years were with the Cleveland Indians in 1988 and 89 and 88 he went 14 and 10 at a 4-2-4 earned run average 89 nine wins 14 losses with an ERA of 3.63 then the arm difficulties and you see that excellent crowd here at Anaheim Stadium and they expect very good crowd nearly 100,000 for this three game series with the Toronto Blue Jays the defending world champions it is rather muggy here as there is an overcast sky Defensively, Fred, you can take a look at what John Farrell will have behind him. Yeah, the Angels have played very well defensively this year, but a couple of guys to look for today are J.T. Snow at first base, who was hot as a pistol in April and has cooled off dramatically in May, and Tim Salmon in right field has kind of picked up the slack for Snow's offensive woes here in May. He's hot, so it's they're ham and egg in it pretty well together. And Myers, who is John Farrell's personal catcher, will be behind home plate. John Orton, though, is out with a sore shoulder, but Buck Rogers hopes to get him back when they head out on the road next week. Well, here we go, and to lead things off, Devon White, he's a center fielder, and his numbers are outstanding. 320 with an on-base percentage of 364. And he is a former California Angel, and he goes after the first pitch, and J.T. Snow is right there and beats him back to the bag. One out. Well, Fred, JT has been slumping at the plate, but in the field, he has been sensational. That's what you like to see again for your young players. Even if they're having trouble at the plate, don't carry it into the field. Makes a nice play. Devon White jumping on the first sinker that he sees and hits a rope, but JT made a nice play. I mean, when you come up and you play two months of the season and they start comparing your glove with that of Wes Parker and Don Mattingly, I mean, they absolutely think this guy is going to win some gold gloves over at first base. I think second is Roberto Alomar. White, Alomar, Molitor here in the first inning. Toronto beat up the Oakland A's yesterday 13-11 in a very ugly three-hour and 45-minute affair. But the Jays survived. Counts two balls, no stakes to Robbie Alomar. This is low. John Farrell, whose first start this year was April 10th. He lost 5-2 to Detroit, but he said the loss was disappointing, but just the fact that he was able to go out of the mound and throw the baseball four strikes effectively was such a relief. Well, he walks Roberto Alomar here with one out to start this ball game. There's Cito Gaston. 49 years old, won the world championship last year, and Fred, for years, they were making it to the ALCS and even to the World Series, but Cito was taking so much criticism. He's taking a lot of heat, but you can't argue with his success. You know, mm -hmm. 
He's won every time he's been out there. They either win the division or they're second or they win the World Series and he's still taking heat. I mean, what does the guy have to do? Well, he, his personality is so low key. He never really sells himself. And here is the fella he got in the offseason replaced Dave Winfield, who was one of the studs to bring in that world championship last year, and that's Paul Molitor. Molitor has been their designated hitter, taking over for Winfield. Alomar with very good speed. He has stolen 18 bases this year. And Paul's a, a great guy to have at the plate if you have a base runner at first base. Squares to bunt. Yeah, Molly can really handle the bat. He's a great hit and run guy. He can hit behind the runner. He can pull the ball. He can do anything you want him to do. He's an ideal third place hitter. In Milwaukee for his 15 years, he had lead off most of his career. So he knows how to get on base. Again, a little calling card over to first base. And last year with Pat Listash stealing so many bases and Daryl Hamilton in front of them, he gave them opportunities. He is very, very patient at the plate. Alomar with a good lead. He's not going in the pitch. He's swung on, fouled off. One ball, one strike. Well, see, Molly's not afraid to go deep into the count, meaning that uh, he's not afraid to take a couple of pitches, even though maybe he might get a good ball to hit early in the count where a guy can steal a base. He's not afraid to go strike one, strike two. He can still handle the bat and successfully hit the ball the other way. And they play him straight away, both on the outfield, on the infield, and Alomar. With the lead at first base, he's not going, and Molly took a shot towards right field but fouled it off. And the count goes to one and two. Warm afternoon, everybody's in their shirt sleeves. They're going to go home and have a Memorial Day barbecue after this one. There's Snow and Alomar to the young guns in the American League. Snow, the rookie, and Alomar, well, he's now 25 years old. Seems like he's been playing for 10. Three time All Star. California coming off a three game sweep of the Baltimore Orioles. And Farrell ready the one two. And misses away two balls and two strikes. Toronto was up in Oakland and did not play well defensively against the Oakland A's but did survive in the Oakland Coliseum and they came out still in second place tie with the New York Yankees of course Detroit is in first place with a record of 30 and 18 in the last 11 games I mean they went 20 and 19 the first month and a half of the year eight and three the last earned run average their pitching has been so much better yeah look at that team batting average of 292 <laughs> And that's what you see in the College World Series. Alomar's going throw to second base is not in time. Number 19 for Robbie. Robbie got a pretty good jump. Comes up uh, holding his back a little bit. That's what that head first slide is going to do for you. He takes a peek here. This infield during day games is a little bit slower. That's what runner, and he does beat it. Gets his hand, left hand in there before the tag. Nice throw by Myers. But this is a soft track during the day games here. They water it down so that the infield doesn't get too dusty. And it's not a fast track for these runners. Blue Jays have a runner in scoring position with one out. Molitor and Carter coming up. And Molitor sends one in the air. Left field, Luis Polonia's there and makes the catch. Alomar bluffed the move to third base, but Polonia's throw was right on target so Robbie stays at second base two outs so John Farrell now must face Joe Carter here's Polonia making the play you don't really uh, want to challenge a left fielder with a, a semi shallow ball <laughs> to third base especially with two outs balls right on the bag Alomar did make him throw the ball, though, and that's what he wanted to do. Maybe the throw gets by him. So here comes Joe Carter, one for six in 
yesterday's win and that was a home run his 13th of the year off Storm Davis and he takes strike one. Right now John Farrell's flirting with danger because he's getting the ball up in the zone a lot. I haven't seen a ball down to the knees yet so where a sinker ball pitcher should be. That's right. It's not a good sign for him early. Farrell's 0-1 and again it stays up and Carter whacks it foul but he's in the hole no balls two strikes. Well he might survive this inning but I think you're right he'll be telling himself in the dugout get the ball down. A lot of times uh, John Farrell throws pretty hard a lot of times sinker ballers throw a little bit too hard early in the game they have to tire out a little bit to get the ball to sink. And the 0 2 pitch struck him out. Great pitch fading away from Joe Carter. A nothing nothing ball game in the first. Steve Fiziak Fred Lynn back at Anaheim Stadium a scoreless ball game Toronto and California we head to the bottom of the first inning and let's take a look at those angel lineups tonight leading things off for our skipper Buck Rogers will be the left fielder Luis Polonia he'll be followed by Chad Curtis the center fielder then Tim Salmon who has been hot hit a home run yesterday Shelly Davis is the designated hitter then former Blue Jay Greg Myers JT Snow bat six and Tori Lovello in for rookie Damian Easley Rene Gonzalez it's eighth and the shortstop Gary DeSarcina will bat ninth and on the mound for Toronto Jack Morris yeah, Jack has uh, been struggling of late and here you see his numbers and that ERA is astronomical for Jack. In fact, uh, teams are hitting him at a 376 clip. That's just unbelievable. And Jack has just been getting the ball over the middle of the plate a little bit too much. And he's, you, know, you see his innings pitched and hits allowed, 64 hits for 38 innings. That's a ton. It's a ton of hits. And Jack has a good fastball. He has lost a little of the zip on it that he used to have. He has a very good fork ball. And when he gets in trouble, that fork ball tumbles a little bit instead of breaking down sharply. He does have a very good slider and a very, very slow changeup. When you talk about competing, he is not lost at all in that area of his game. And defensively, Fred, we will see behind Jack Morris today. Now the de defense for the Toronto Blue Jays has been pretty decent thus far. And a couple of guys that helped out a lot for the offense of the Toronto Blue Jays or John Olrood leading the league and hitting and Paul Molitor the DH for their club is second in the league and hitting He's definitely made people forget about Dave Winfield. Of course you have white in center field with those four gold, gold gloves and Alomar at second base he's fabulous defensively there's Buck Rogers what a start he has had it was about this time last year when Buck was in the hospital after that Buck. Back. And he and Whitey Herzog have built a real winner this season after completely, completely changing the theme of their team. Very old last year with guys like Von Hayes and Hubie Brooks and Lance Parrish. They've gone the youth movement this year, playing with so many youngsters, and they have had such great pitching. And that is the reason California is in first place. There is Domingo Cedeno, the shortstop. He is the older brother of Andujar Sedano of the Houston Astros. And here's Luis Polonia to lead things off, and he takes strike one. Polonia hitting 270 this year, has a home run. He did that last Tuesday in Seattle. Down the line, a high arching shot into the Kingdom seats. He fouls this one off, and he's in the hole no balls, two strikes. Polony is a little bit of an unusual leadoff hitter in that he doesn't walk very often. He's up there slashing away. You saw his on base percentage is only 318 for hitting 270. That's pretty low. He, he's up there cutting and slashing. Swing and a miss, and down goes Luis at a pitch in the dirt. And Morris with his first strikeout of this game. This is what Morris can make you do when he has his good fork ball. That ball goes down into the dirt. It looks like it's going to be a fastball strike, and all of a sudden, whoop, it's a fork ball in the dirt, and hitters can't lay off. That's Jack Morris at his best. So one out in the batter is Chad Curtis, and what a story this young man has been. 329 the batting average. His on-base percentage, fifth best in the American League at over 42%. He has a pair of home runs. Chad Curtis a 45th round draft choice and if you ask him why he'll say easy 
I'm five feet ten inches tall and only 175 pounds and they don't look at the little guys now, especially in the outfield where they expect guys to hit for power and you have to be very very quick which he is he can run he, he plays a, a great center field but uh, there's a lot of guys that are bigger and stronger and those are the guys that the scouts look for he goes to right field Darren Jackson excellent defensively is there makes the catch two outs. The clouds have broken away it was completely overcast about a half hour 45 minutes ago and that was holding the humidity in here and Fred you played here when it is a hot it's an afternoon ball game to that ball will really carry much better than it does in the evening. Yeah, you just have to hit it hit it well today, and it will go out. The ball carries here extremely well during the daytime. A little emphasis on the extremely. The ball me, in on you, and you can turn on it. That's right. The pitchers don't like <laughs> to pitch when the daylight the daylight hours here. Hitters love to hit though. Well, here's Tim Salmon. Having a terrific year. Salmon hitting 282. Hit his ninth home run yesterday. It was a big one. A three run shot in the second inning when California scored seven runs on Baltimore and survived that contest seven to five. Boy, he crushes this one, but right at the center fielder, Devon White, who comes on to make the catch in a one, two, three inning for Morris. He strikes out one, and we are through one scoreless game. Chris Myers here in our studios. Good to have you with us on Memorial Day. We'll be keeping an eye on all the other activity here in Oakland. Cal Ripton to Kevin Seitzer. They got Brady Anderson in a rundown, but Seitzer throws it away. His third error in the last two games. Anderson comes around to score, and Mike Mussina and the O's have the one to nothing lead. Let's go back to Steve Fiziak and Fred Lynn. I know that you will. Always good to hear Chris Myers. It's a scoreless ball game, Toronto and California. And John Farrell will face John Olrood, one of the top hitters in the American League, hitting 391. He has just been mashing it. Leads the American League in hitting. They always thought he would be a 300 plus hitter, 20 home runs and 100 RBIs, and he mashes this one deep to right field. Back goes Salmon. It is way out of here. The eighth home run of the year for John Olrood, and it gives Toronto a 1 0 lead on California. Love those day games. <laughs> that ball actually had a little bit of sink to it, but when you're facing a guy who's hitting 390, he can hit all kinds of pitches. Hits it well, you know, but the ball didn't really jump off his bat, but it carried very well. Farrell comes back to throw ball one to Ed Spray. What a year he has had. A Paul Molitor walked up to him, who's his new teammate in spring training. Fred said, when are you going to win a batting title? And he, and he said of, this year. Kind of puffed his <laughs> chest out. Well, you know, he's a very, very patient guy. And when he joined the club, right out of Washington State, I mean, he didn't appear in the minor leagues at all. Very quiet and very unassuming. And... Uh, not one of those ready to strut his stuff kind of guys. Ed Sprague pops one up foul territory. J.T. Snow. One out. And because of that I don't think he had the kind of confidence in his ability that his teammates had in him. Yeah he's a real quiet individual but this year they wanted him to become a little bit more aggressive a little bit more assertive because he's a big guy and he can hit for power as we just saw and with the absence of Dave Winfield they thought they needed that little extra oomph so I said hey don't take quite as many pitches you know we don't want you to walk 150 times go ahead and swing at a few of those there's Darren Jackson he swings and misses strike one Jackson started the year with the San Diego Padres organization came over to Toronto in the trade for Derek Bell who's having quite a year for the Padres. Jackson hitting 233 with four home runs at his fourth on Saturday and there's Olerud who just hit his eighth to give the Jays a one nothing lead. Check swing ground ball JT's no that's an easy one JT in two outs.
check out the American League East. Detroit on top in the East. Their hitting has been absolutely amazing. They have a record of 30 and 18. Then it's Toronto and New York tied for second place. Boston continues to pitch well. They're the best pitching team in the American League. Milwaukee, Baltimore, and Cleveland. Who was your pick to start the year, Fred? Well, I'm sorry to say it was Baltimore. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm not going to Vegas anytime soon. I really thought the Orioles had everything. I did too. Pitching staff looks strong. Ooh, that one hurt a little bit. That Borders goes down in a heap at home plate. That's when you know a sinker baller is working. You know, when he gets a lot of balls off, hit off the feet, especially with a right-handed hitter, this ball is going to come down and into him, and he hits it right on top of the ball, and he drives it right into his back foot. I mean, that's very unusual. You hardly ever see that. How that hurts. Skipper Cito Gaston never moved from the dugout. Here's the 1-1 one, one pitch. And it just misses away. And it's two balls and a strike to Pat Borders. In the air, right center field. Salmon. That will do it for John Farrell in California, but he gives up his first hit of the game. That the home run by John Allroot. And it is 1-0 Toronto. Introducing the 1993 Murray Genuine Draft Light IndyCar. This year, say MGD Light and say no more. Can anyone stop the Red Hot Phillies? The Reds will give it a shot tonight. All the ball on ESPN. Jack Morris ready for his second inning of work. 1-0. Toronto has the lead on John Olrude's eighth home run of the year. And Morris here in the second will face Chili Davis, Greg Myers, and J.T. Snow. And Chili takes strike one. Davis with batting average that is not where he would like to see it at 216 he at 288 last year with Minnesota his home run numbers were down so were his RBI totals but Chili Davis is always expected to be about 270 280 near 20 home runs and he hits from both sides of the plate and they expected him to solidify the middle of their offense in the cleanup spot you would see Chili Davis with those kind of numbers Fred you would really be surprised this two months into the year that California would be in first place. Yeah, they'd be in first place by a lot more games if he starts to get a little bit hot with that bat. Check to swing but take strike two. Two balls, two strikes. Because he's got power from both sides and he can be a real asset in the middle of that lineup but thus far he's been struggling. High three balls and two strikes. Morris now 38 years old, raised in St. Paul, Minnesota, but now lives his days in the state of Montana. Loves to hunt and fish. 16th year in the big leagues. The 3-2. Hit hard. Right field base hit. One thing about Jack, he doesn't like to walk hitters. So if you get him behind in the count, he's going to come in there with a pretty good pitch to hit. He, and Chile got a fastball right down the gut. And Jack's lucky he didn't park that one. Well, here comes Greg Myers. He is the former Toronto Blue Jay. Came over last year to California on July 31st. was after Lance Parrish had been released and later picked up by the Seattle Mariners but Myers and John Orton have received much of the work but Orton is now down with a bad shoulder so Myers is sharing that responsibility with Ron Tingley and 
Myers with a ground ball looks like two there's one and dug out nicely by John Olwood for the double play. This is a pitcher's best friend is the double play ball. Morris entices Myers to hit a ground ball and Sedano gets rid of this ball really quickly to Alomar and once you give it to Alomar it's all over. Although he does bounce it, Olerud makes a nice dig at first. Cito's got the same expression <laughs> no matter what the situation. <laughs> He has a talented team once again. Here is J.T. Snow. Boy, has he been in a terrible slump. And he waves at a split-fingered fastball. And he's in the hole. No balls, two strikes. He's been looking at the hole in the last month of the season. I mean, on April 24th, this fellow is hitting 407. He is now hitting 216. He's gone through a 111 slump. And he just kind of sneaks that one over the third baseman, Ed Sprague. He throws out JT by a step and a half. We are through two here in Anaheim. One nothing Toronto. John Farrell ready for his third inning of work. He gave up the home run to John Olroot for the Toronto one nothing lead. Let's check out the American League West where California has the three game edge on Chicago and Kansas City. Then Texas three and a half back followed by Seattle, Minnesota and Oakland. And there were many, as we talked about in pregame, who expected California to be at the bottom of that list. Here is Domingo Cedeno. What a game he had yesterday. His first four RBI game of his very young career. And Toronto's two-run win over the Oakland A's. Oh, he came right inside, and I think it hit Cedeno's hand. And they're saying it's a foul ball. Well, it doesn't hurt so much now. Domingo was in pain for a while, and then as soon as the umpire said, no, no, it didn't hurt, it hit the bat, here comes Cito Gaston. That's always a tough call for an umpire, because he can't see it, but he hears it. You know, if he hears it hit the bat, he's going to call it a foul ball, irregardless if it hits your finger beforehand or not. He's going to try to, I don't know if he's going to slap this ball, well, it looked like it hit the knob of the bat before it hit any kind of hand. Fred, it looked like both of his hands were off the bat. It sure did. As it was approaching home plate. Maybe it hit the knob of the bat and the bat hit him in the chest. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So Farrell will try it again with Cedeno. There's a ground ball, second base, Lobello, and he throws out Domingo Cedeno. One out. Let's see if we can hear it this time, Fred. Ouch. I can hear an ouch. You know, but it was interesting how how less the pain was when he realized the ball was that, called. That's no, right. Now, foul. He, now he knows he has to hit again. He said, well, well I better quit acting. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's a nice try, though. I've got to save my best stuff. When I can try and convince the umpire rather when he has already made the decision. We head back to the top of the lineup, and that's Devon White. 0 for 1, grounded out to first baseman J.T. Snow, who retired him on an excellent play. One ball, one strike. John Farrell was expected to start this year down in the minor leagues. They expected him to get his work in down in AAA and then maybe get the call up. We talked about him missing last two three years with elbow problems he was in the disabled list five times during that span and they really anticipated Russ Springer to be in the rotation he's down in AAA and Buck Rogers was saying hey I thought it was going to be Langston Finley and then Russ Springer Springer was well off in spring training and Scott Sanderson was outstanding. He became the third starter and Buck Rogers said Sanderson's my man. He has given him seven wins and nine decisions and a swing and a miss by White. Strikeout number two for John Farrell. Here's a case where you think he's going to throw a sinker and he throws the ball up even though it, you think of a sinker baller not throwing very hard when Farrell gets the ball up he can throw it by you. You can't think of him as just a, an exclusively a sinker baller. 
And there's strike one to Robbie Alomar. So after the home run by Alderode, Farrell back on Beamy's retired five straight. And starts out Alomar with strike one. One ball, one strike. But then you know that listening to Tim Tashita. Alomar fouls it out of play. Fred, how much has California surprised you this year? Well, you never can really tell how rookies are going to do. You just don't know. So in the pre in the, in the scouting, there's a scouting report right there of Bobby Knopp. You just don't know how to, to, to predict what they're going to do. Alomar pops it up. Lavallo calls everybody off, makes the catch, and Farrell gets the Blue Jays 1-2-3 here in the third. It's 1-0 Toronto. The Blue Jays have the lead on John O'Root's home run, and here we go. Bottom three, it'll be Tori Lavallo, Rene Gonzalez, and Gary DeSarcina. Bello did not play yesterday. He is actually giving Damian Easley, the rookie second baseman, a day off because Easley has suffered really a lot of pain in his shins. And he has had several days off in this month of May. Bello, 27 years old, played college baseball at one of Fred's favorite schools, UCLA. <laughs> Head, of course, an All-American USC Trojan, and I understand you're club has a test today don't they yeah they have to sweep the uh, University of Texas to go back to Omaha I'm pulling for the boys. you're hoping to meet them there this Fred will be bringing the College World Series your way with Tim Brando and Mike Patrick and who else will be there Steve Garvey's gonna Steve be there. Garvey's gonna be there that's a great time the baller with the count two and one and it misses away it's three balls and one strike Morris Tori Lovello. This is a situation Jack does not want to get in. He doesn't want to get behind to these hitters. Plus he has to have to come in with that fastball. And he misses away ball four, so the leadoff man is on. That represents the tying run. And here comes Rene Gonzalez. Morris is coming off his worst outing of the year. Last start, he tied a season high for earned runs allowed as the Brewers beat him 8 1 at the Sky Dome. Four innings of work, and that pushes earned run average to 10.24. Hmm. Here comes Rene Gonzalez. He has a home run, only one, though, since. June 23rd last year and the runner goes and he had a great jump there's the throw to second base not nearly in time Fred Lavallo had a good eight foot lead and then just started running as Morris was very very slow in bringing it to home plate yeah, Jack is notoriously slow to the plate and he really doesn't pay that much attention to runners and <laughs> Lavallo had this one stealing st stolen stand up just about I mean <laughs> Jack didn't even think about throwing to first base. So, Torrey, I played with him. I know he's slow. He can't run, but Jack is so slow and deliberate to the plate that even you could probably steal seven. Even me. <laughs> <laughs> well, Torrey's in scoring position for Buck Rogers. That's one thing that Whitey Herzog and Buck have done this year. They have gone with a very aggressive style. A club that was last in the American League and run scored last year at just three and a half a game is averaging one more run per game this season. And Gonzalez fouls it off. Well, I'm sure it's it's uh, Buck Rogers game plan today to run every time they get on base because Jack is slow to the plate and Borders is not known for his arm strength either throwing the ball. So with that combination I would think that every time anybody that can run at all is going to be running today. Morris with the one one pitch. Gonzalez chopper up the middle. Alomar can't get it. Lovello around third. He will score. We are tied at one. It's a 
nice piece of hitting by Gonzo. All he's trying to do is hit the ball to the right side to advance Torrey Lavello to third base with less than two outs. And when you try to do that, good things happen to you. You try to play the game the right way, good things happen. And he sneaks the ball up the middle. And a boy for Torrey. Let's see how quickly Rene decides to go. Morris does have a good move to first base. And Rene is not going right now as D. Sarcina bluffed. A move to bunt that brought Sprague down the line at third. Ed has had a rough go defensively of late. He had four errors in the last four games. Three of those in that Oakland series. Gonzalez is going, and De Sarcina swings and just throws the bat away. The ball is dropped by Pat Borders. And Renee will have to go back to first base as he just did catch a piece of that ball. Well, Renee's not a speed demon, but he does have five stolen bases. So that, like I said, anybody that can run a lick is going to be going today. And there was a nice hit run drive by Gonzalez and then De Sarcina, but it just didn't work out. We'll try it again with a count one ball, one strike. talked about his move he was third last year in the American League in runners caught stealing and it was mainly because of his move to first base as Fred said he is extremely slow home a high leg kick Gonzalez going the pitch a little chopper Sprague knocks it down only play is first and they get the man there so moving into scoring position is Gonzalez with one out One one ball game in the third inning at Anaheim California and Toronto and we head back to the top of the order and Luis Poloni who struck out swinging on three pitches against Jack Morris to start this game. That's in there. Luis now 28 years old from the Dominican Republic. Angels most valuable player last year. Squares to bunt. And after bluffing I thought Sprague might come in a bit but he was still a good four feet behind the bag and off the line a good 12 feet. If you're, a, if you're a good bunter you have to be way in past the bag. If you're even with a bag a good bunter is going to beat you. And Polonia is a pretty good bunner. Now Spray can back up even more over third base. Two strikes in the batter, Luis Polonia. This is low. Ball and two strikes. Gonzalez at second base. One out in the third. Pounds it back at the middle. Alomar backhands. That may save a run as Gonzalez went wide of third but came back. Runners at the corners, only one out. Now, Alomar showing you why he is a gold glove winner. He has great range. This ball looked like it was a base hit all the way. Makes a nice sliding play and then from his knees, wisely throws to third base trying to catch Rene Gonzalez making too big a turn around third but Gonzo was alert to the throw. That's pretty good base running there Ken Maka. Right away as soon as you saw Alomar glove the baseball he said Rene back to third back to third. Polonia, man, he's really a threat to go. He has 10 stolen bases this year. He does not go in the pitch. Is hit down the line. That looks like extra bases. Gonzalez will score easily. Polonia's around third, and he's coming home. It's 3-1 to one California. doing too much wrong right now Fred no they're not and 
even though they're not stealing a lot of bases, the threat of the steal may be affecting Jack's concentration a little bit. He gets a ball up in the middle of the plate, and Curtis ropes it down the left field line. Carter has to wait and see what this ball's going to do down there. Rolls around a little bit. He doesn't want to allow a triple, but with Polonia's speed, he gets home easily on the double by Curtis. And that Chad Curtis just looks better and better. He knocks in RBIs 21 and 22. Here comes Galen Sisko out to talk with Jack Morris. Cito, the expression again does not change. He has won three American League East titles his last four years, so he knows about pressure. So does this man. We saw him a year and a half ago. It's one of the best games I've ever seen pitched in postseason play. Game seven of the World Series. Beat the Atlanta Braves 1-0 in 10 innings. And Jack win all 10. Fort ball low. So faces Tim Salmon. With one out in the third. Chad Curtis at second base. Alabar moves over towards second. Salmon, big swing and a miss. A ball to strike. Tim Salmon rockets one to Sprague, but he grabs it on one hop, throws out Salmon, two out. Ed Sprague's had a couple of tough days in Oakland, but he's made two nice plays in this inning alone. Here's a short hop bullet. That's why they call it the hot corner. That's plenty of time to throw out Salmon, but that ball was a bullet. The dirt you were talking about here at Anaheim. It, they used to really criticize this place. It has improved. Yeah, about four or five years ago, they changed the composition of the infield. It used to be a crushed brick. And boy, was it tough to play on. It's get all beautiful, kinds of, but you're right, it's that's tough. That's right. It looks good, but the infielders used to hate it. That's a little like Dodger Stadium. It used to be the same thing. And uh, every time it gets chewed up a little bit, it gets just terrible hops on it. It gets really hard. And now they've put more sand in it, and it's a little bit more true. Infielders get better hops in this one. Chili Davis with the count. One ball, no strikes. He single the right field his first time up. Angels want more. Curtis at second base and two outs, and Chili fouls it off. Well, coming your way tomorrow night on ESPN, we have the Baltimore Orioles and Cal Ripken Jr. At Oakland Coliseum against Ricky Henderson and the Oakland A's. That begins at 7.30 on the West Coast, 10.30 Eastern time. Following game one, Stanley Cup Finals, the LA Kings and the Montreal Canadiens in this area really hopping about the way their Kings have played. Wayne Gretzky, what a final games he had. Man, he was sensational. The 1 1 in there. A ball, two strikes to Chile. Two years ago, he was the designated hitter of the year for the Minnesota Twins, helping them to the World Championship. Then he struggled a little bit last year and was in his final year of his contract, and the Angels quickly signed him. They needed a cleanup man. Chile grounds it. First baseman all route. He'll take it himself. But California comes up with a big three spot on that man, Jack Morris, to claim a 3-1 lead on Toronto. Mets at Chicago. Bobby Bonilla, two homers yesterday, facing Mike Harkey, leading off the second. Another home run, his 13th of the year, and Eric Hillman and the Mets have a 1-0 lead in the fourth at Chicago. At Minnesota, Texas leading 1-0. Butch Davis trying to add to it. It's up there. It's out there. But Kirby Puckett is back there and takes a home run away. But Charlie Liebrand pitches the shutout and the Rangers win 1-0. Back to Fred and Steve. And that snaps that Minnesota hot streak. They had won four straight games. Here we are at Anaheim Stadium. Steve Fiziak and Fred Lynn. And the Angels have a 3-1 lead on the Toronto Blue Jays. 
as California scoring three times in their half of the third. Top of the fourth inning we go and lay things off. Paul Molitor, he'll be followed by Joe Carter and then John Olroo. This has been the month for Paul Molitor. I mean, he's hitting 380 in the month of May, and a guy who will give you sometimes 10 to 15 home runs a year has given them five in the month alone. Foul back. Joe Carter was saying, hey, he's taking all my RBIs away. Remember the guys behind you. Yeah, but Joe, <laughs> he's hitting 345. You know, he's on base a lot for him, too. Don't forget that. And he also moves runners around. Merrill came inside. Two balls and a strike. Buck Rogers. Team coming back from a 1 0 deficit to claim a 3 1 lead. Timely hitting, very aggressive running. Got them their lead. Got 3 1 to Molitor. He fly to left field his first time up. Merrill has walked only one. And now he's walked two. And it starts the fourth inning, and that was just the way Jack Morris started his troublesome third. Well, if you're a manager, you just love to see your pitcher come out and get that first out after you've scored three runs to take the lead. You don't want to get the momentum back to the other team. So good speed and a fine base runner at first base. And okay, Joe Carter, you talked about him taking your RBIs. Now you've got one at first base, and it's your teammate Paul. Right, he was talking about that and true appreciation because Joe hit third last year and Dave Winfield hit behind him and they had to flip flop. Carter still has 41 RBI, so he's not complaining that much and he spanks this one hard down the left field side for a strike. Joe second in RBIs in the American League with 41. Albert Bell has 44 for Cleveland. strike. Carter really one of the nicest people you'll find in the game. He's from Oklahoma City, went to Wichita State. He went to the College World Series. Matter of fact, he was college baseball's player of the year back in 1981. Mollard doesn't go and Joe lets it stray outside. Comes from a wonderful family. Is very athletic family. Joe's dad was uh, one of the best bowlers I understand in all of Oklahoma City. Is Mom Athlina was a uh, top basketball player and he has three sisters all who ride in the rodeo and I, I guess one of the sisters he bought a ten thousand dollar rodeo horse in the offseason and she's winning all kinds of trophies. Here's a two one. In the air down the right field line and J.T. Snow will give way to the second baseman Lavallo and he makes the catch one out. Here comes John Olroot, and he is leading the American League and hitting at 391. Molitor of the Jays is second at 342. He's at first base, then it's Lofton, who's had an excellent comeback season after fine rookie campaign. Juan Gonzalez, Mo Vaughn, and Chad Curtis of California. So we have this afternoon three of the top six. Olroot, Molitor, and Curtis on display in Anaheim. John went deep his first time. If he does that here, we'll have a tie game of three. And it's away, ball one. He is a good looking hitter. In there, ball and a strike. I am broadcasting with one of the guys who had one of the sweetest swings for a left-hander and Fred Lynn, so I, I know you can appreciate Olroot stroke. Yeah, he uh, doesn't have any wasted movement in his swing. It's very compact, very economical. And when he swings, he usually makes contact. Outside corner, strike two, one ball, two strikes. 
And Fred, is that unusual for a guy his size, six four, six five? Yeah, it is. Uh, to be that compact for that kind of size is unusual, and that what that's what makes him such a a average hitter. You know, he's hitting three ninety four, and most big guys can't do that. They can hit for power, but they can't hit for the high average because they have a too long a swing most of the time, too many holes in it. But right now, this young man doesn't have too many holes in this one. It's low. And the catch, two balls and two strikes. Plus, he's very patient. And notice he didn't swing at those two first two sinkers from John Farrell that were caught the outside corner. A lot of young guys would wail away at anything that they see, but he wants a ball that he can handle. And until he gets it, he's not going to swing. Well, he hits that one deep to right field. Salmon going back. Allroot with back-to-back -back home runs. This is what makes Toronto tough. Doesn't matter how many you score, they can score a lot of runs. Here's the swing from Olrud. It's a high changeup. That's a changeup right in the middle of the plate. And Olrud is not fooled. See how compact he is? His weight is back. And even though it's a changeup, he crushes it. And we are tied at three. He has had a pretty good last couple of days. Olrud against Oakland yesterday was up four times, scored four runs, had two hits, and RBI hit his seventh home run off Storm Davis. So right now it's his third home run in the last two games. And the average right near 400. Pitch to Ed Sprague is low. A ball a strike. It's very tough to fool a hitter who's very compact because he doesn't lunge at the ball, doesn't jump at the ball. And I don't think a, a change up with two strikes is a particularly good pitch anyway because hitters are looking for it. Change-ups early in the count when you're behind as a pitcher are good pitches, but when you have the, when you're ahead of the hitter, he's alerted to something different, at a little off speed. He's alerted to the fact he's guarding the plate. He's not going to take his biggest swing anyway. That one misses, and it's three and one, Dad Sprague. You know, to talk about what you were you know, mentioning. Uh, and obviously he does not have the stuff of a Roger Clemens, but Clemens had 11 strikeouts on Friday. All 11 were on the fastball. And that's still the best pitch. And there's ball four to spray. Two walks in the inning. One is already scored in front of the John Olrood home run. You see hitters when they get behind in the count, they're starting to think about breaking balls now. You know, they think about fastballs early and breaking balls late. Well, if you pitch backwards, if you throw the breaking stuff early and the fastball's late, you can strike guys out or break bats, get inside on them. But if you do it the other way, the normal way, good hitters are going to eat you up. And that's what Clemens did early in the count. I mean, he was throwing that split-fingered fastball, surprising them with strike one, and all of a sudden the hitters became defensive. If you can get your breaking stuff over early in the count, you are in the driver's seat because now you can do anything you want with them later in the count. You set them up. They've already seen that. Now they got to look for it. Now you blow the fastball right by them. Well, here is Darren Jackson. Swing and a miss. Darren has averaged 20 home runs his last two seasons, both with the San Diego Padres. But then in the cost-cutting program that the Padres have been known for lately well he went to Toronto this is away ball a strike yeah DJ's going through that adjustment period coming from the National League over to the American League doesn't know the pitchers yet hasn't seen them all plus he lost a lot of weight he was ill early in the season he hasn't gained back all his weight so he's not full strength yet two and one they're hitting a coach, Larry Heisel. He was working close with Darren Jackson to get him back, understanding, like you said, the pitchers in the new league and what they would throw in certain situations. Pitch it hard, Rene Gonzalez. They've got one on the first double play. 
But John Olrood with his second home run of the game has tied. This is your world. So Greg Myers is on to lead off the bottom of the fourth. Well, you work on this play all spring training. Pitchers and the infielders, they work on this play to death all spring. Olrud makes a nice backhand stab, kind of an in-between hop. Then he kind of, ooh, the ball sticks in his fingers a little bit, and Jack can't get it. Jack's a good fielder, too, so that had to be a really a bad throw for, not, for Jack not to be able to handle it. And I'm not sure if he was guiding and leading him. Don't you just kind of toss it to the bag? Yeah, you try to get it to the bag, exactly, but... In that case, you know, that's a pretty long throw to underhand it. You know, you might want to turn to the side, give him a little flip. Sidearm flip, get the ball on a line to Jack. It's a little easier to see. But the ball looked like it hung up on his fingertips. A 3-3 ball game. J.T. Snow is the batter, and already it's strike one. I'm not even sure if he's seen a pitch yet. It's strike one, and he hammers one. And... Uh, Left field for a base hit, and an enormous weight comes off the shoulders of J.T. Snow. And I know it's just for the moment, but this fella has been working so hard in batting practice, coming out early, taking extra hitting. He finally gets a knock, and he's at first base with nobody out. Williams jumps up in that Toronto bullpen. Here's the pitch to Snow, and it's a ball up in the zone, and, and Jack right now is getting the ball up and out over the plate. It's not a good combination, and JT pokes it into the left field. So here's Torrey Lovello. He walked and scored his first time up. High. Jack Morris, he doesn't look like the same pitcher, won 21 games last year, most in the American League. He has been up in the strike zone with everything. You're talking about that split finger just kind of tumbling towards home plate. That has been the pitch that has hurt him the most, and that's not working. Then the pitchers or the hitters are just looking fastball. Misses just a bit inside. Two balls and no strikes. Angels with runners on first and second. That's Myers, second base, Snow at first. Sprague even with the bag at third. Ooh. Two and one. As a hitter, you, you can't hold Jack cheaply. You know, he can still get it up there, and right now he's a little upset, so I'm sure the adrenaline's running in him pretty good. If he throws a fastball, you better be ready for the fastball because he can still get up there in that 90 range. Lavallo pops it up. Alomar has to shade his eyes to battle the sun. He makes the catch and one out. We've got a great showcase coming your way on ESPN tomorrow night. The NHL Stanley Cup Finals, the LA Kings and Montreal Canadiens. Game one, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 in the West Coast. Game one of the seven-game series. Gretzky, who was marvelous in game six and seven for the Kings and one for the Canadiens. All comes your way on the Total Sports Network. Robbie Alomar, who is not wearing sunglasses, now thinks better and puts them on. He's fighting that sun. Gonzalez single, drove in a run, and came around to score in the double by Chad Curtis, his last time up. Tries right, to go to right field and fouls it off. They sent both runners that time. Renee's a pretty good guy to hit and run with. You know, he's not a power guy, but he handles the butt pretty well, and he hits the ball the other way very well. Good man in this situation, do the hit a little hit and running. And that's a sunglass suitcase. 
Yeah, Robbie must not have seen his because how could you not take sunglasses out? There's not a cloud in the sky right now. I've never been able to understand that. A ball, a strike. by Morris one ball two strikes Jack has a pretty good slider today the only problem is is that he can't locate his fastball to set up his other pitches every time he throws a fastball it's out over the middle of the plate and they're hammering it and if he doesn't get his slider over consistently they just sit on the fastball Gonzalez a little more defensive hitter this time he swings goes the right side base hit Rounding third, coming home is Greg Myers. Going to third is J.T. Snow. He's in there. It's 4-3 California. And those are two really good at-bats for Rene Gonzalez. Yeah, he's just trying to put the bat on the ball, and like we suggested, he does go the other way very well. And here he is, inside out. Nice swing by Gonzo. Pokes the ball into right field. Now, on this play, I thought DJ was coming home. I'm not quite sure why he decided to go to third on this play, because he had just as good a shot at getting the guy at the plate as he did at third base. But that's a decision that he made, albeit the wrong one in that situation. But... And here's Gary D. Sarcina. Now runners at second and third base. Only one out. And Jack Morris again being bombed. Woody Williams is warming down the Toronto bullpen. Ground ball. Sprague knocks it down. He's coming home. They've got him in a rundown. Now it's Gonzalez's job to get to third base. He does that. Snow is tagged out and having to stay at first is D. Sarcina. Runners at the corners for the Angels. Chugan and Luis Polonia stepping to the plate. Now Sprague does come in a bit of third. Allroot holding the man at first base to a big hole between first and second base. Let's see how they work him. Polonia does like to shoot that ball down the left field side, particularly with that outside pitch. got one on the outside corner and that's a strike. Yeah, here's a situation where Jack wants to keep the ball away. His defensive shading Polonia the other way so you pitch him away, play him away. You don't want to give him something inside where he can pull it to that hole. This time it misses away and it's a ball and a strike. Carter is shallow and left. Jackson regular depth at right field and the one one pitch he chops it to first Allroot knocks it down underhands to Morris and he just does get there in time to make the out but California comes up with the go ahead run at the bottom of the fourth to take a 4 3 lead on Toronto Fifth inning we go, 4-3 California leading the Toronto Blue Jays and to lead things off, their catcher Pat Borders. And Borders smokes one deep left, back goes Polonia, and he says, see you later to that one. We're tied again, this time at four. Great place to hit during the daytime. That's three for Toronto. Borders jumps on his first fastball. Actually, he's a pretty good sinker down and in. But if you're a right-handed hitter, that's where you're going to be looking. And Farrell has now gone 
54 innings this year, and he has given up 10 home runs. That's a lot of home runs for a supposedly sinker baller. You know, and if you go like uh, 200 innings, 200 plus innings, if you're looking at Burt Blylevin in territory, you remember that year he gave up like 52 home runs pitching in Minnesota? Here's Domingo Cedeno. He's 0 for 1, grounded out of the second baseman his first time up. That was to start the third inning. And Cedeno skies one in the air, center field. Chad Curtis racing over, makes the catch just in front of Luis Polonia. Let's go to Chris Myers. All right, Steve. Budweiser takes us to Wrigley. The Cubs rallying against the Mets. Steve Bouchelle with a base hit, scoring Ryan Sandberg. Joe Orsalak is going to try and get Sammy Sosa going to third, and he does. Hundley has homer, though, and the Mets lead 3-2 in the fifth. Let's go back to Anaheim. Fred Lynn and Steve Fizia. All right. Thanks to that proud dad, Chris Myers. Here we are in Anaheim, tied at four, Toronto and California. John Farrell with one out facing Devon White. He's 0 for 2, grounded out to first base his first time up and struck out swinging his last. And he swings and misses here. It's one ball and one strike. Ground ball off the glove of Gonzalez. No chance to get White. A base hit for White. He's now one for three. Now Devo takes a sinker the other way. Gonzo was in it even at the bag, protecting against the bunt. Doesn't have much time to do anything. Makes a pretty good effort, but can't quite come up with it. All right, with one out, a steal situation anytime White's at first base, but Robbie Alleman is there. He's a very patient hitter. White has a good lead at first base. He has stolen 12 bases this year and has only been caught one time. Chad Curtis of California leads everybody in the American League in stolen bases with 25, then Kenny Lofton of Cleveland has 23. Alomar squares, pitch high. All no strikes. Blue Jays again in one of those back and forth games. They had one yesterday at the Oakland Coliseum. This is being played a little, a little more uh, organized fashion. That one yesterday was a, was an ugly one. Bad defense, bad pitching. In Toronto, all you can say is they survived. Hitting coach was the man with the smile on his face after the game with the pitching coach. Ooh, Galen Cisco. Snow holding white. That 1 0 pitch out's a, a great move if it works. But if it doesn't, now you get 2 0 to a dangerous hitter. And it's not as if this man has been sharp with his control. No, that's right. Gaston, 10-year Major League career, Milwaukee, San Diego, and Atlanta. Alomar again squares. This time takes a strike. It's two balls and one strike. Angels have their bullpen working as well with Scott Lewis, a right-hander, Ken Patterson, a southpaw throwing. There's Rich Hacker down at third base giving the signs for Robbie Alomar. Good time to go for White with the count two and one and one out. Tie game 4-4. Four, four. White doesn't go, and the pitch is hit in the air, left field, long run, Polonia. He's there. Makes the catch. Two outs. And there's the Angels' bullpen. Right-hander is Lewis, the fellow you can barely see, is Ken Patterson. Well, this game figured to be a game of bullpens because the starters ERAs were five and ten respectively. We figured to see the bullpen get into this game at some point. And really they needed innings from Jack Morris for Toronto today after giving up 11 runs with five pitches going to the mound yesterday in Oakland. And 
Morris has been known to do just that throughout his career. Give his team seven, eight solid innings. Here's Paul Molitor. 0 for 1. He walked his last time and scored in the home run by John Olrud. White does not go and the pitch misses. A ball and no strikes. Two balls and no strikes. White has been around this California area, started his career with the Angels in his final season. Doug, Re Doug Rader, who is the skipper before Buck Rogers, only at 216. He does go this time. The throw to second base, not nearly in time. Well, he got there fast. He's standing up when the ball's arriving. I don't think Myers, if he just would have run down there to put the ball right on the bag would have gotten him. There's a great jump by Devo and look at him go. Even when he's slowing down. He, <laughs> boy, that's that's a great thing to have that kind of speed. And now Molitor has to count his way three balls no strikes. Farrell steps off. I mean sure first base is open. But do you want to pitch to Joe Carter or Paul Molitor. The 3 0. It misses inside, ball four, so they will pitch to Joe Carter. Runners on first and second, two outs. We on ESPN have the French Open coming your way early tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock here on the West Coast at 9 on the East Coast. Among tomorrow's matches, Steffi Graf and Jennifer Capriati. Barry Joe Fernandez and Gabriela Sabatini. That's here on ESPN, the French Open Tennis Championship. Carla Carter, strike one. Runners go. The pitch by Carter. Smoke down the left field side with foul. The white had third base stolen. If they were going to challenge anybody. It probably would have been Molitor at second base because White just had a huge break towards third. Yeah, in that situation, Molly's got to watch Devo all the way. If he sees him break, then he goes. And that's what the runner at first has to do he's always got to keep his eye on that lead runner to see what he's going to do in, in Devo's case he could run at any any time so Molly has to be alert for that this time Lovello cheats over towards second base a little and the 0-2 pitch and Carter swings and misses striking out but Farrell gives up a leadoff home run to Pat Borders that ties the game at four That cute lead very next inning they come right back so let's see what the California Angels do in their half of inning number five Chad Curtis will lead things off will be followed by Tim Salmon and Chili Davis Chad one for two he doubled in two runs his last time up there into the corner and that scored Polonia and Gonzalez one ball one strike. You know, you look at Curtis and his college teammate, Tim Salmon, their numbers very, very similar. I mean, power numbers, average numbers. Yet Salmon goes in the third round and Curtis goes in the 45th round. And, and, and you ask him and he said, yeah, the difference is 5'10 to 6'2. And he was, I mean, he sets his jaw too, Fred, when he, when he talks about it. But he also followed up by saying, but, if everybody had my attitude and my desire, well, I wouldn't be playing in the major leagues. That's right. That's one great thing about baseball. It really doesn't matter how big you are. And if you've got a big heart and you have some talent, you can get here. Here's a 3-1. And Curtis smokes it again down the line, but foul. I mean, you played against a guy who was a shortstop for the Kansas City Royals, Freddie Pontek, and boy, he had tremendous desire. 
Yeah, Freddie was about 5'4", and, you know, he lasted a long time. He also played against a guy named Harry Chappas, and I think he was about 5'3". So it doesn't matter how size, the, the size of your body. It's the size, size of your heart. And there's Rod Carew, hitting coach for the Angels. Curtis fighting this one off. Count is full. Three balls, two strikes to Chad Curtis. He's worked so well with Curtis. Curtis only at 259 last year, but he, he knew Chad was going to be one of his top pupils because he's constantly with him, constantly listening, con constantly taking advice, and trying to make himself better. It's high ball four, so Curtis is on. Chris Myers. Steve Budweiser, Texas to Wrigley. Fifth inning, you see the situation. Bases loaded, Harkey to Howard Johnson, and Hojo delivers. It's going to be a triple. Coleman scores. Tony Fernandez races home. And Bobby Bonilla, who was intentionally walked, also comes in. It's 6-3 New York back to Fred and the man affectionately known as Steve Psyche. There you go, Chris. I knew I would get some comment. As he would say, I know that you will. All right. We have Tim Salmon at the play with a man on first base to go ahead run and Chad Curtis. The stolen base king in the American League with 25 already this year. In there for a strike. Salmon lined hard to the center fielder, Devon White, in the first grounded out to the third baseman in the third. Fred, you talk to scouts around the major leagues, and they absolutely love this kid, Salmon. 6'2", 215, very strong swing, and a fine defensive outfielder. Yeah, he's one of the best arms in right field in the American League, and uh, he's a complete player, you know. He just doesn't hit home runs. He hits for average. He can do a lot of things to help this ball club and has been doing them. And he's come up with clutch hits this year. I mean, you talk about the home runs. I know you were talking about the David Cohn home run. He beat Roger Clemens here at Anaheim. He beat Jim Abbott later that week and the New York Yankees. Seems like every time he has come up with a big hit, it has been at a clutch time, and we have one of those again. And he takes strike two, a ball, two strikes. Yeah, that's where sometimes stats can be deceiving in that you can pile up a lot of numbers in this game, but sometimes they really don't help your team that much. I like to see guys who do it when you need it, you know, when you're behind or when you're tied. What do they do then? You know, if you make the score eight to two with another home run, great, but it really doesn't help the team that much. Here is the one two. Curtis goes and Salmon fouls it off. Barry Bonds is having that type of season for San Francisco. Ten of his 14 home runs this year have either tied the game or given them the lead. And yesterday they were down to Tom Glavin in Atlanta and Bonds in the late innings. It's a three-run bomb to win the game. Yeah, and I think that's a worthwhile stat. You know, what do you do with your team down a run, tied, or up a run? You know, I think that's a good stat. But some of these other things that you come up with, you know, what do they do at daylight at 4:15? You know, who really cares? But those things are relevant. Let's take a look at the American League stolen base leaders. Chad Curtis right on top with 25 stolen bases. And then the guy everybody thought would win the race this year. And Kenny Lofton of Cleveland with 23. Robbie Alomar, he still has had a slow offensive start, but with 18 stolen bases. Lance Johnson with 16. Ricky Henderson tied with him. Ricky's been beat up with several leg problems. And White of the Blue Jays. There is Chad Curtis, and the count to Tim Salmon is a ball and two strikes. And he's a very aggressive base runner. Buck Rogers working with him early in the season because he thought, yeah, he's very aggressive, very intense, but sometimes he runs himself into mistakes. And that is what we're trying to keep him from. Curtis doesn't go, and the pitch taken up. 2-2. Two, two. 
Jack has struggled this entire game. He'll tell himself, I can be beaten, but I will never quit. Curtis digging in at first. He goes. Pitch swing and a miss. The throw to second, not nearly in time. And backing it up is Domingo Sedano. So Salmon strikes out, one out now in the fifth inning. Curtis moves into scoring position. Yeah, Curtis is dug in like the old track meet before they had your own blocks you had to dig your own hole he had a great jump he has this base stolen easily but he's going with two strikes and then sometimes that's tough on the hitter when he has two strikes on him especially he's a young hitter sometimes they can't lay off that breaking ball they know the runner's going and they immediately want to swing that's 26 stolen bases now for Curtis Especially with a young hitter up there, that's when you want your base stealers to try to run early in the count if they can. It's Chili Davis, and he takes a strike. Fred, interesting situation. Second base umpire John Shulock before the pitch, as Curtis had the lead, and before Morris was coming home, he was behind second base and then came in. Uh, I'm not sure if he was just in a bad position. Pickoff play at second base. But he does have a better angle now. I will say that. That's the reason he came in. Just for that reason. He knows Curtis is a threat to steal third. He wants to get in so that he is not behind the play if there's a pickoff play. He has a better look there. All he, he's looking right at it. Here's the play. Shulock is looking right at this. If he's on the outfield grass, he can't tell if the ball is going to get in there ahead of Curtis. Curtis goes. The pitch swung on and missed. Throw to third. In time. And Buck Rogers comes out of the California dugout. Sure, Buck saying, hey, listen, he tagged him on the chest. If he tags him on his chest, his feet has to be on the bag. Curtis got a pretty good jump there. I think everybody in the ballpark knew he was going to try to run it, including umpire Shulock. Here he goes. He's going full speed after about three steps. Here's the slide in. And there's a tag high on the leg. And if you tag a guy on the leg that high, and he Ooh. is... Boy, that's close. Yeah, it's really I'll tell you what, bang, we, can't, we can't tell on, on slow-mo, so you got to give the umpire some credit there. He called it as he saw it. Curtis doesn't think so, but... I remember old umpire Tom Gorman who said, anytime I got those bang-bang plays at first base, I called them out and made the game go faster. So two outs now. Nobody on. Chili Davis, the batter, the 0-2 pitch. Misses the ball and two strikes. That would coincide with what the uh, major leagues want this year. Shorter games. They're trying to shorten them like 15, 20 minutes. Nope, you didn't go around. The count's two and two. Good luck on trying to shorten them 15 to 20 minutes. Oh, you got to play way. seven innings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll see them 15 minutes shorter in the College World Series. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. The 2-2. Ground ball. Base hit up the middle. Now that caught stealing a third really looms big. Four four ball game. Bottom of the fifth in Anaheim. And there's Chad Curtis. He's cut down trying to steal third base. And Chile gets another ball down the middle. And even though he's not swinging the bat too well, just about any kind of major league hitter can handle that kind of pitch. Greg Myers, the batter with Davis at first base. And even Chile is bluffing a move. The former high school catcher from Dorsey High School here in Los Angeles. Chile never known for his wheels. And he's 
edged his lead to four feet now. And Myers pops it up. Third baseman Sprague wants it and has it. So the threat over here for California in the fifth. We go to number six here in Anaheim. Four. And if he pulls that one, he's got number three. Well, he has seen the ball well. Here's Ed Sprague. Go for one, popped up and walked. the big head against the Oakland A's yesterday. Spray with the A's leading 11 and 9. He just blasted a two run home run down the line at the Oakland Coliseum that just did sneak around the foul pole but it got out like right now. And he fouls this one off. One ball two strikes. Of course Ed with that huge home run last year in the World Series the first time he stepped to the plate in the World Series his very first at bat he did something only one of 22 ball players have done in Major League history he went deep and it won the ball game this time he sends a ground ball to John Farrell and Sprague is thrown out well, Fred right now Morris and Farrell are giving Buck Rogers and Cito Gaston in the innings they needed from their starting pitchers. Yeah, they, they wanted these guys to get into that sixth, seventh inning anyway to give their middle relievers a, a day off. Something which Toronto especially needed. The sinking fastball that misses. One ball, no strikes to Darren Jackson. He's over two, a pair of ground outs. His last was a 5 4 3 double play. on that pitch one ball one strike here's DJ looking for a, a fastball in but gets a slider away and he was definitely fooled Fouls this went off a ball and two strikes as a right handed hitter facing a right handed sinker baller that has a slider until you get two strikes, you have to pick one of those pitches out that you want to attack, either the fastball in or the slider away. But it's very difficult to cover both of them until you get two strikes. And you have to be a little bit more defensive. The one, two, and he tried to go away, but misses. It's two balls and two strikes. Two and two. Larry Heisel, the hitting instructor, and his team has been hopping it away. Second best in the American League with a 281 average. Detroit is a 283 coming into this ball game, but Toronto has labored with their pitching. There's a ground ball, second base, and John Farrell has his first one, two, three inning since the third and only his second of this game. We are tied at four. Budweiser takes us to Oakland. The Orioles in the sixth inning off Ron Darling. That is Cal Ripken, and that is just fair as Ricky Henderson chases it down. McLemore is in. Devereaux doubled home Ripken to give the O's a 3-0 lead. Mucina has allowed just one hit. You can see Cal Ripken and the O's against Rick and the A's tomorrow on ESPN. Let's go back to Anaheim. Thank you, Chris. It's a 4-4 ball game, and Jack Moore stands in there against J.T. Snow. Snow, one for two in the ball game. Here's Bobby Knopf. Hey, Bobby wanted to say hello and get well to his wife, Lefty. Her, uh, her alias is Sharon. He said she only knows her name, Lefty, but she's had the chicken pox, so he was very concerned and wanted to say, get well soon. He needs someone to throw batting practice to the Angels. There's a pop-up, and the third baseman, Ed Sprague, takes care of it. So one out for Tori Lovello. As the Anaheim crowd, stadium attendance has just been announced. It's over 30,000 for this Memorial Day. Again, they expect between 90 and 100,000 for this three-game series. World champion Blue Jays are in town.
Angels with three in the third inning, one more in the fourth. And that's high. Two balls and no strikes. Last year when Jack Morris had his 21 and 6 campaign, he had an earned run average over four. One of only 14 pitchers in Major League history to win 20 games with an ERA that high. And there's a pop foul and spray going over, but it will be out of play. I mean, Fred, there was a, a pitcher by the name of Bobo Newsom who pitched for the old St. Louis Browns back in 1938. He had an ERA of 5.08. And he went 20 and 16, but even more remarkable was Lefty Gomez with the Yankees in 32. He wins 24 games, only loses seven, and had an earned run average of 4.2, but again, he had Gehrig and Ruth hitting for him. Yeah, what that tells me about those kind of guys, especially Jack, is that he will carry the game into the late innings, and if his team is way ahead, say 8-2, to two, for an example, he doesn't care if he gives up a run or two late in the game. He just wants that win for his ball club. Therefore, he gives you a lot of innings. Maybe he gives up a few runs, but he gets a lot of W's. The 2-2 pitch and Lavallo going to left center field. Joe Carter cuts it off. Two outs. And Fred, to add to that, when you watch Jack Morris pitch, I mean, if the score is eight to nothing, he'll give up some runs and he'll make it eight to six. But sure. if it's a one-nothing ball game, you better watch out because he's just going to be tougher. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, if his team's not scoring any runs, seems like he makes more quality pitches. And when he's be his team he has a big lead, he has, he throw a lot of strikes. He's not going to walk anybody. He's going to make you hit the ball to get on. And there was no more classic example of that in that game seven of the World Series two years ago when he was with the Minnesota Twins. And he went ten innings and beat Atlanta one nothing. Every single pitch mattered, and he was on the black in every single. I think he threw like 150 pitches in that game, and every single one was right there where it needed to be. Rene Gonzalez was two for two, swings and grounds went up the middle, cut off by Sedeno, and he throws out Rene. Hey, we're seeing some one, two, three innings by Farrell and by Morris. It remains a 4 4 game. Three in the third, but John Olrood hit a two-run home run to tie it up. Angels came back in the fourth. Jays came up with one more in the fifth, and that's where we are. 4-4 four, four as we head to number seven. And John Farrell will be throwing to Pat Borders. And Pat, who tied this game up in the fifth inning with a leadoff home run, takes strike one. And he spanks this one to right center field. That's a base hit. So the leadoff man is on for the Blue Jays, and we'll go to Domingo Sedania. Let's see what kind of situation he is in. A rookie, will they have him sacrificed to second base? Number nine hitter will face Farrell. Then we go to White, Alomar, and Molitor. And they love to have borders at second base. Sedanio is in a sacrifice situation, and Farrell's pitch is bunted. And Gonzalez only play first base and borders to second. One out. Well, the rookie did a nice job. Couldn't have laid it out there any better. Yeah, it's a good field to bunt on. It's pretty soft out in front of home plate here in Anaheim. And he gets the head of the bat in front of the plate, which is just the way you want to do it. And what you want to do is you just want to catch the ball. Just assume you're catching the ball like you would with a glove, but you're doing it with the end of the bat. And that's how you deaden the ball and lay down a nice punt. Now we go to Devon White. One for three in the game. That an infield hit his last time up there. Knocking one off the glove of Rene Gonzalez. Sneaking behind. Matt Borders was Gary D. Sarcina, but the tag not in time. Hey, interesting. John Shulock was caught in the outfield on that on that play. Now he's moving in again. <laughs> Here's the play. Borders sneaks in. He knows Borders the catcher. He didn't figure he was going to be running. Yeah, that was the exact same situation with Chad Curtis. On the first pitch, he was you know, in, in kind of short left field, and then came in when he realized, well, maybe Curtis is going to go. 
Well, maybe they will have a pickoff play at second base. Yeah, that's right. You know, you, you can expect that from Curtis, but I don't know about Borders. Two balls, no strikes. Rich Hacker and Bob Baylor are the base coaches. Pat Borders at second base. One out, top of the seventh inning. Again, the pickoff play, and again, Borders just in time. What the Angels are doing here, they're just trying to keep Borders close so that if there's a base hit, the outfielders have a chance to throw him out at the plate. They don't expect him to try to steal third in this situation. But they don't want him to get that big lead either so that they can score easily in a base hit. There's Curtis. He is deep in center. Everybody else. Medium depth and left and right, and they come inside to Devon White. And it's three balls and no strikes. Here's a pitch to Devo, and he wants to get that sinker inside, and he got it in there all right. That's all right, though. If you're going to miss inside, miss in off the plate. Don't miss out over the plate. And now they're going to put him on. So they intentionally walk Devon White to set up a double play as Robbie Alomar comes to the plate. And Robbie has done something that is rather unusual this year. As you take a look at Lewis and Patterson warming down on that Angels bullpen. He only grounded into three double plays last year, yet he is one of the leaders in the first two months this season in grounding into double plays. He's done it already seven times. White with outstanding speed at first base, borders at second base. Hits it hard, deep to right field, Salmon back, he leaps, and it's gone. A three-run home run for Roberto Alomar. So much for strategy. The strategy is sound if it's a good sinker, but this ball is up, and Robbie loves the ball up and in when he's hitting left handed. And that ball's about belt high, and he, he gets just enough of it to get it over the fence. Salmon made a nice effort, but couldn't grab it. And California finds himself down by three. Roberto Alomar hitting just his fourth home run of the year. But it breaks the four all tie and gives the Blue Jays a 7 4 advantage on the Angels. And now it's Paul Molitor's turn. Came on his 100th pitch of the game. There has been a difficult part of the California first two months, it has been their bullpen. Here's the 1-1 one, one pitch. And it is in there. A ball and two strikes. And Fred, when you really take a look at what California, where they might be, if they had a top closer like Brian Harvey and Joe Gray to set you up, then you're looking at maybe a team with a 5-6 game lead in the American League West. But, hey, everybody was thinking this team would be in last place. All the young players are going with it. And really, uh, it was the ownership, Jackie Autry, saying, hey, we have to cut payroll and we have to build from within that's so. all right but you know when you have a guy like Brian Harvey I mean he's that's a franchise type player I mean those kind of guys there's Whitey Herzog and those guys just don't grow on trees I mean he's a premier closer and to get rid of him it's a tough thing to do you know, those are the kind of guys you try to build your club around. Okay, fine, you want to build from within, that's great, but you have to have some kind of nucleus, and that would be a pretty good start in my book. Here's the 3-2 pitch. And it is high, ball four. 
So Molitor is on. And that might be just about it for John Farrell. Buck Rogers. He has had Lewis. He has had Patterson warming in the bullpen. And Buck Rogers will make a pitching change here. Farrell, who started this inning, tied at four, allowed a base hit to Borders. The sacrifice by Cedeno, the intentional walk to White to get to Alomar, and Roberto smoked a three-run home run to right field. The Blue Jays have gone deep four times in the game and now lead 7-4. New pitcher for the California Angels is Ken Patterson. He allowed two runs and two hits in an inning and two-thirds just yesterday in their 7-5 win over the Baltimore Royals this year, 13 and a third with an ERA of 5-4. Five, 5-4, four. Five, four. boy, I'll tell you what, it, that's a lot for a middle reliever because a lot of those runs aren't his that he inherits, but hopefully he'll be able to get some of his fork balls over right now. He uses his fastball to set up his fork ball, and he does throw a slider and a curve, so he's got all the pitches. It's just a matter of if he can get them over at the right time. And this has been the one-week area the Angels team in 1993. Their offense has been very sharp. The defense much improved. Their starting pitching is outstanding. But the relief pen, well, as Buck Rogers said, you know, we are always looking for help. So that's what Whitey Herzog has been doing. But they do not want to break up this ball club. And, uh, and your purse strings are a little tight. Sometimes it's difficult to make the moves you want to move. And here comes Joe Carter. Paul Molitor at first base. One out in the seventh inning. Blue Jays up by three. Joe is 0 for 3, and he has struck out two times. Patterson comes home, and the pitch to Carter is fouled off right field side. J.T. Snow will not have a play. Kind of interesting that they brought in Patterson when really the Blue Jays are predominantly a right-handed hitting lineup, with the exception of Old Rudo, who has had a pretty good day today. But uh, to bring in a left-handed to face Toronto, you know, these, I guarantee you, Carter likes it. Joe fouls it off. He's in hole, no balls, and two strikes. One thing Buck wanted to do, particularly with Patterson, is last week he had not pitched him in ten days. He wanted to give him some work and. Uh, he did that last week and can pitch yesterday an inning and two thirds so he might be in there just for this inning to try and get them out of this frame. Chopper foul. Maybe he wants to see if that split finger pitch will, will work against a right hander. There's John Olru. This man has been extreme trouble. Two home runs, and he almost had a third had he pulled the ball. The 0 2. He reached for that one and punches it into left field for a base hit. Rounding second, going to third is Molitor. Here's the throw. It's cut off. Play it second. Safe. That's great hustle by Paul Molitor. He sees that the ball's out in front of him. It not hit very hard. And with Carter's at bat, you have to play him deep. And Polonia comes in. You see Molly sees that Polonia is not hustling after the ball, and he just takes advantage of it. Molitor, 35 years old, can still motor. He's always been a good base runner, very aggressive. And Joe Carter just follows him into second. All right, now what do you do with Olru? you got to walk him. Even if it's left-hander against left-hander with Sprague who's hitting the ball well on deck. They will intentionally walk John Olru. He has two home runs in the game. And the last Blue Jay to hit three in a contest was George Bell back in 1988 against Kansas City. Sometimes you have to just respect who's the hot hitter. Olru has been just that. 
and not only does he have two home runs today but he's leading the league in hitting so he's doing that against everybody. And you know they'll face a lot of right handers but late innings they're bringing in situation taps and here comes Buck Rogers and they intentionally pass over to load the bases with only one out Sprague will be the eighth man to bat in this inning it's already seven to four Toronto. ESPN Major League Baseball is brought to you by Smooth Bush Beer, an easy drinking Bush Light. And by Tenactin. If you want a medicine that acts tough, get tough acting Tenactin. Yeah, that was Fred's boat just off Newport Beach. Steve Fiziak and Fred Lynn this afternoon on Memorial Day with Toronto leading California 7-4. And the new pitcher for the Angels is Scott Lewis. Yeah, Scotty Lewis uh, has had a few starts for manager Buck Rogers this year, but he's been relegated to long relief, and he features an average fastball, has a little bit of movement, but his bread and butter are his slider and his curveball, and he's got pretty good breaking stuff, but once again, he's got to get that fastball over and locate it to set up his breaking stuff. The first man he will face is Ed Sprague as he continues his warm-up tosses. 27 years old. He was born in one of the really beautiful places in America, Grants Pass, Oregon. Grew up in Medford, another gorgeous place. And here we have 30,620 on hand at Anaheim Stadium, Southern California, enjoying this one. But they'd be smiling more if their angels were in front. Right now, they trail by three. Bases are loaded. Swing and a miss by Ed Spray. He is 0 for 2, walk once. And he has Molitor at third, Carter at second, Olrood at first base. Only one out. Midfield in looking for the play at the plate. Chopper, foul. This is where it really helps to know your pitchers. You know, Lewis is a young guy and, and Sprague may or may not know what he features, but he's throwing two sliders right away. And you know, you come in here with the bases loaded, you think you're getting a fastball first pitch, and the guy starts throwing breaking ball. That's when you really want to know the pitchers and what they're going to throw in a tight situation. Lewis has the count his way, 0 and 2. Goes high, ball and two strikes. to right center field. This will score a run as Salmon makes the catch. Tagging a third is Molitor. He comes home at his 8-4 Toronto. Going to third base, Joe Carter. Well, Sprague did the job. He wanted to get the ball in the outfield if he could to at least get one of the runners in. He hit that slider, the same pitch he saw the first pitch. This time he's looking for it for two strikes. He's able to get it far enough to advance Molitor to the plate. And now the ninth man to bat in this inning. Darren Jackson. The only man who has not been on base in the game for Toronto. He's over three, three ground outs, and he has runners on first and third for him. He goes after the first offering and fouls it off. a very lonely feeling when your ball club has eight runs and you don't have a hit. You haven't even been on base yet. No, that's not good. You're not even sweating. Lewis with the 0-1. A little grounder, short. B. Sarcina to Lavallo at second base for the fours. So nine Jays come to the plate. Four run score. Then at Anaheim Stadium, it's 8-4. Now Blue Jays have the lead, and the new pitcher is Gregory Scott Woody Williams, a former college shortstop turned pitcher, 2-7 the earned run average. He's thrown 10 innings of work this year. He is a middle reliever, Cito Gaston. 
and there's a base hit to left field. De Sarcino starts the seventh inning well. Roberto Alomar comes in to talk to Woody just a bit. He's a 27 year old right hander from the Houston Texas area. Cy Fair High School in Houston back in 1984 and on to the University of Houston. Colonia takes a ball. Luis today has been on base once. That was the infield hit back in the third inning, and he came around to score in the double by Chad Curtis. Swing. Got a fish probably out of the zone. It is one ball, one strike. Probably out of the zone. I think it was. <laughs> so I was giving him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe, you know, whose zone are we talking about? The strike zone or Luis's zone? Scores. Chicago has beaten the Knicks. Jordan had 54. Well, John Starks can talk a good game, but his defense was a bit off this afternoon. I guess the slump is over. I guess. He was three for 18, what, the last game, and he goes for 54. Yeah, that's what Atlantic City will do for you. <laughs> I thought it was a bunch of noise when they got on him about it. I thought, hey, give the guy a break. He has an odd job at odd hours. If he wants to go with his dad to Atlantic City, give me a break. It's not like they played a morning game or something. You know, they play at 8 o'clock at night. I think he could sleep in. Yeah, he was really tired today. Outside corner. Williams pitched once on his road trip Saturday in Oakland in relief of Dave Stewart who won in his return to the Coliseum and the runner goes and the pitch misses inside ball four so Polonia's on De Sarcina goes to second base and all Woody Williams needs to do is put one man on base more and the tying run will come to the plate. Mike Timlin is warming down in the Toronto bullpen. Had borders. I mean, this conversation, you know, might be about nothing, but just giving that man a little more time to throw. Pitchers who need high top shoes. Okay, Fred, your comment? <laughs> <laughs> the face said it all. He has ankle problems. Okay. It's the style. One ball, no strikes to Chad Curtis. And Williams is working himself into more and more difficulty. Here in inning number seven, Toronto and Cito Gaston. They've got a four run lead. in there ball and a strike when I mean, you visit with Cito Gaston of what the difference was in 92 to 91 about the Blue Jays and why they won the world championship he said 91 we didn't put teams away I knew last year we did that and we had the mentality to do it well this game they have an opportunity to put the Angels away but will they As Curtis fouls it back is one ball two strikes. Here's the one two on the ground second the shortstop and they get the double play big outs for Woody Williams. And there's a big sigh of relief. That's that's exactly what Toronto needed there and this man in particular Woody Williams. I mean he's not an overpowering guy anyway. And he induced the ground ball double play. And even if you are as fast as Curtis is, you can't outrun that baby. And here comes Tim Salmon. 
breaking ball misses. Salmon today 0 for 3 lined out to center grounded out and struck out his last time. Boy, he's got a good curveball. Yeah, you know, Williams is really a finesse type pitcher. He can't overpower you with his fastball. He, he's sneaky at best, but he does have a good curveball and a good slider. But he's got to get those babies over early. Here's a 1-1. One, one. Snaps on the outside corner. Third, the one two pitch. High, two balls and two strikes. Inning started quite well with Gary D. Sarcina reaching on the base at the left. Luis Polonia walked, runners in first and second, nobody out, but Chad Curtis grounded into a 6 4 3 double play. Curveball, pop foul. Two and two. Boy, he does not want to come in with the fastball. When he has, it's been out of the strike zone. Scouting report says about salmon. No fastballs, please. No, nothing out over the plate. Keep the ball in on them if you can. And most big guys, that's the book on them. Don't let them extend their arms. And salmon does have real good power to right center. So you got to keep the ball in on them if you can. Again, they try to put a wrinkle into that one, and it's into the seats. Count remains two balls and two strikes. Of all the home runs of Salmon, I've seen him hit this year. They've all been fastballs. I haven't seen him hit a breaking ball yet. It's not to say that he doesn't hit them, but I haven't seen one. Let's see if he goes away this time with the breaking ball, but it just does miss off the corner, and it's full three balls and two strikes. Toronto leading eight to four coming up next on ESPN uh, as far as baseball goes we'll have the San Diego Padres and Atlanta Braves Whitehurst against Greg Maddox chance to see one of baseball's best pitchers again the pitch and this time Salmon pops it center field white back right field side and makes the catch so the threat goes down for the Angels and we head to the eighth Toronto leading by four. With Toronto leading eight to four over the California Angels, we'll see the major league debut of 24-year-old Daryl Scott. Yeah, Daryl Scott uh, features a an average fastball, but with the adrenaline flowing, it might be a little bit above average right now. He has a slider, and his bread and butter pitch is a split finger fastball, which induces a lot of strikeouts with it. Drops bottom drops out of it when it's working well. Native of Fresno, California, pitched very well in AAA, striking out 27 and allowing only seven runs in his 24 innings. Filed a record of 4 and 0 and an earned run average of 2.96 in a league, the Pacific Coast League, where if you have an ERA under four, you are considered a major league prospect. During his career, Scott has registered more strikeouts than innings pitched at every level and his 290 strikeouts and 219 career made minor league innings. He came up when Chuck Krim was optioned out. They released Chuck Krim, 31 year old right hander. Came to this club for Mike Fetters and Glenn Carter in 1991. So Scott trying to help out what has been a damaged bullpen in recent weeks. The first man he will face is Pat Borders who started the four run seventh inning. Solid base at the left field so Pat two for three in the night with a home run and a base hit. Well eventually it's going to turn into the night. No, has no room. And it's one ball and one strike. It's night somewhere. Somewhere it is night. At the French Open. They're not playing. 
course, we'll have the French Open tomorrow, 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock West Coast here on ESPN. He got himself a souvenir. One one pitch. Base hit left field for Pat Bordas. Three hits on the afternoon. Welcome to the big leagues, kid. They hit that split finger pitch up here. They got the NHL coming your way on ESPN tomorrow night. The flag flying for the Canadians. Los Angeles Kings will be at Montreal. Wayne Gretzky, who had the fabulous finish to their series with Toronto, goes against Y. And the Montreal Canadiens begin 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 West Coast, right here on ESPN. And hey, there's an L.A. Kings fan. Everybody is right now. Chance for two, but they only get one. So one out here in the eighth inning. Hockey. I've just been told by Susan Heeman that they are completing construction of the pond, the home of the mighty ducks, just across the freeway from here. I didn't know hockey was that big in Southern California, Fred. But I skated all the time in yeah. Southern California. You know, you can you can do a lot of that in April. There's a lot of ice around. Well, the Blue Jays had ducks in the pond in the last inning, and we'll have the mighty ducks in the pond <laughs> next year. <laughs> Man at first base for Devon White, one out. Yeah, you did a lot of skating over there in Newport Beach, didn't you? Oh, sure. <laughs> Put those big nor'easters in here. <laughs> <laughs> One one pitch with the runner going check swing by White the throw to second not nearly in time. Domingo Cedeno with a stolen base and we've got time to check in with Chris Myers. All right Budweiser takes us to Oakland Mike you see to Steve working on a shutout until Brent Gates gets one through the left side and Mike Aldretti scores for the A's. That's the way it's been for Oakland this year Baltimore leading 3-1 they're in the eighth. Let's go back to Fred and Steve in sunny warm Southern California. And I am sorry Chris but that does not deserve. Oh wow. That was just an average highlight. Here it's eight to four Toronto leading California. Domingo Cedeno at second base. It's a fellow who's been there because it had so many injuries to that shortstop position. Alfredo Griffin has had shoulder problems. Dickie Schofield is with the club. He is a cast on his left arm. A severe break. He'll be gone for the entire season. And the pitch high. And they really feel their future is still down in the minor leagues and a shortstop by the name of Alex Gonzalez. And Luis Soho is off the disabled list, but still not 100%. He can play short and second base. And the 3 2. And White pops it foul again. Blue Jays' offense has been carrying this club. I mean, another eight runs this afternoon. They're beginning to look like the Detroit Tigers. And their pitching staff, you know, is still down near the bottom in the American League. Earned an average of about 4 6. Been hitting over 300 their last 20 games. They punched out eight base hits to go with the eight runs this afternoon. Swung on and missed. Down goes White. There's the first major league strikeout. Darrell Scott. So Daniel leads from second base. 
ground ball hit hard to De Sarcina, but an easy play to throw out Robbie Alomar. California goes to the bottom of the eighth, trailing by four to the Toronto Blue Jays. Final question, ladies. How would you save the planet? Tax credits for education. Aggressive environmental legislation. Baltimore's iron horse, Cal Ripken, keeps on rolling as the old teacher Ricky Henderson on the athletics. Tomorrow night at 10.30 Eastern on ESPN, Tuesday Night Baseball. Ah, the life of a relief pitcher. I mean, he's got the lazy boy up there. Just hanging out. Well, they've got their own set of stands out there. Yeah. You know, canopy, nice cover. You don't see that you know, on the visitor wist side. Some wisteria would look nice. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it? Ron Tingley was out there earlier, and he had taken some plastic yellow tape, you know, that they put around crime, crime scenes. Crime scene, It's right. a police line. Uh, please do not uh, come near this area. That was like the batter's box to Ron Tingley for a while. He couldn't get in a, in a bat. Tingley said the other day when he finally got his first at bat after a month. There it is. That's what he had wrapped around himself. It was wrapped around the batter's box. Shelly Davis pops it foul. But he said he felt like calling the American Embassy and saying, let me out. I've been held hostage long enough. Tingley uh, played yesterday and had a pair of base hits in their two run win over the Baltimore Orioles. Tim Lynn is ready if needed in the Toronto bullpen. And there is strike three to Chile Davis. Well, it's the first time that somebody's taken a third strike all day. Good fastball runs back over the plate. Chile gave up on it, and that ball tailed right back over the inside corner. Good pitch by Woody Williams. Woody will now face Greg Myers. High ball one. foul back we started with Jack Morris and John Farrell and they were damaged but right now Morris stands to be the winning pitcher and go to three and five on the year Buck Rogers has Joe Gray up down in the California bullpen Timlin has been warming in the Blue Jays pen ground ball Foul, John Olroot. We were talking about Lefty Gomez earlier in that year where he had the 24 wins and an earned run average of over four. I remember a quote by Lefty. They asked him about his success that year. And he said, well, my success came from clean living and a fast moving outfield. <laughs> that ball is hit in the air. Ed Sprague. Makes the catch two outs. Baseball tomorrow night on ESPN. We've got the Baltimore Orioles and the Oakland A's. That's 10.30 start Eastern time, 7.30 in the Western Cup. The Orioles and the Athletics right here on ESPN. You'll get a chance to see stars like Cal Ripken Jr. and Ricky Henderson. Here in Anaheim, it is 8-4 Toronto. Misses away. And a lot of the kids we're seeing here in the Angels uniforms. Mark Langston pitched so well. Solid starting staff. Snow pops it foul. But so many of the ball players are, are guys. Fred, I know you're doing the College World Series who, who we saw in Omaha just a few seasons back. Three years. Uh, JT spent at Arizona. Outstanding hitter there. Yeah, a lot of these guys they come out of these major college programs, and it doesn't take them long to get to the big leagues anymore. A lot of times they will use the uh, college ranks almost as a minor league. Misses up high, and it's two balls and two strikes. 
great college programs on this West Coast. The state of California is loaded with great collegiate baseball teams. High. Three and two. When you talk about it in the top 20 in the uh, college baseball, uh, Baseball America, there's always like Stanford, Cal, Santa Clara, Fresno State, Long Beach State. UCLA, USC, San Diego. That's eight right there that can be ranked in the top 20. The 3 2. Do you have a pick this year going all the way? I know you've been studying up on. It's, it's, uh, you know, get her like Texas AM. You know, they've got a great pitching staff. University of Texas, you know, they're tough as well. But, uh, Whoever is the hot team when they get in there, the right. pitching staffs, usually usually that team wins. J.T. Snow walks, and he's on first base with two outs. And I know Long Beach State you were talking about, they have been on a hot streak of late. Yeah, they've won 15 in a row, and last year Pepperdine came in there and they threw three straight shutouts. So that's what it takes. You know, the pitching staff has to get hot. And that A&M ball club, don't they have a pitcher, Jeff Granger, who is expected to go in the first round of the draft in a couple of weeks. It's popped up. Foul territory. Sprague will not have a play. Well, it's a great moment, Fred. I know you played in it, but uh, for so many of those athletes, that is their last time they'll ever be playing organized baseball. Yeah. Some will go on. But That's right. They don't realize it at the time because every one of them most to a man thinks that they're going to play Major League Baseball at some point, but most of them do not, and that is it. You know, to get to the College World Series or college playoffs in, in any sport is the pinnacle for a lot of athletes. And of course, we'll see so much of that College World Series right here on ESPN. Fred will be there. Tim Brando will be his partner. Mike Patrick and Steve Garvey. Here's the 1-1 one, one pitch to Tori Lavello, and he takes a strike in the outside corner. One and two. Lavello base hit right center field. Snow, round second, he's heading to third, and here comes the throw from White. Not in time. And it is saved beautifully by Woody Williams, or that would have scored a run. It almost went into the Angels' dugout. Lavello gets a fastball that he can handle, gets a base hit to center. JT Snow living dangerously here. Ooh, oh. makes contact with shortstop Cedeno. But if this throw is right on the bag, it's going to be a bang bang play, and Woody Williams makes us. A save a la a goalie. Shot on goal. Save Williams. <laughs> That's what the pitcher's supposed to do in that situation, though. Back up. Nice play by Williams. Good hustle. Williams trying to close it out for Jack Morris. Went the first six innings of this game, game of four runs, trying to survive for his third win of the year. Timlin is ready in the Blue Jays bullpen. Lavallo at first base, Snow at third. Rene Gonzalez is the batter. Stan Javier has gone to the on deck circle, and Gonzalez fouls it off. Two hits on the afternoon, a single. He came around to score a run in the third. That drove in a run as well. And he drove in a run with a base hit to right field in the fourth. Strike. Oh, and two.
Snow leads from third. LaFollo from first base. They need one more base runner to bring the tying run to the plate. Two outs in the bottom of the eighth inning, and the pitch by Williams misses away. One and two. Balls and two strikes. Snow started the trouble with two outs. He walked, and then Lavello singled the right center field, and Snow went to third in the play. There's Don Stan Javier. The 2 2 pitch. A little check swing. Williams has it. Throws to first and the threat is denied. We head to the ninth here in Anaheim. It is 8 4 Toronto. Closing by committee because of that. But uh, he doesn't have it a, really a one outstanding pitch. He mixes his curveball up with a slider and he throws a kind of a sneaky fastball. He mixes them up really well. Last time he pitched was last Wednesday, allowing two hits and an earned run in just a third of an inning. Right, he said the pain has moved down his neck into his shoulder blades, and it is getting frustrating. So they'll give them an inning if they have to have it. Matter of fact, uh, he was saving games with the sore neck so well for a while that they started calling him Neckersley. <laughs> now it's moved into the shoulder blade, so we got to come up with another nickname. The 0 1 pitch. In the air, right side. JT Snow, one out. Tomorrow morning, we go to Paris for the French Open, 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 of the West Coast, right here on the ESPN. We'll have tomorrow's matches with Stephanie Graff and Jennifer Capriati and Mary Jo Fernandez and Gabriela Sabatini. Those are two outstanding fourth round matches right here on ESPN. Joe Gray has one out as he gets Molitor to pop to Snow. And here's Joe Carter, who is one for four, singled his last time up. A ball and two strikes. Blue Jays, if they win, they'll move the record to 29 and 22. So you need the handle on that where the bottom part extends out where you get the good lift for your legs. Lazy boy action. Gene Nelson is comfortable out there. You know he has seniority to get that yeah. chair. The veteran. Must be over 30. I'm surprised he doesn't have those those beaded um, uh, things that they sure, have like in taxi cabs. Cab drivers, sure. <laughs> A drink holder. What a life. On a Memorial Day, a little grill with burgers. Oh, yeah. Here's the 2 2 pitch. Foul back. Swinging at one out of the strike zone and fouls it off. He got a base hit on one out of the strike zone. Good play. Yeah, like they're going to be able to, to make that catch. Oh, and Joe just fouled it off his foot. This cameraman, they like that airtime, don't they? <laughs> there, hey, there's the shoes. Now, I can understand him with Joe Card. He's got to turn on those bases, hit the bases, make sure it doesn't turn. But a pitcher wearing high tops? I don't know. You know, pitchers you know, maybe wants to uh, slam dunk a ball. I, I have no idea. Ouch, that hurts Joe. Yeah, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a little upset if, like, Payne Stewart is in high top golf shoes. That's when I'm going to. 
but they'll be plaid high top golf shoes. Since it's fouled off. Hey, we've got a proposal that has been uh, etched into the sky by a plane overhead. We've got the marry part in, but we don't know who's going to marry who. There it is. Marry. Maybe it's just a statement. Swing and a miss by Joe Carter. He strikes out. Well, they get a better deal on the letters N-O because what? yes is uh, three letters. <laughs> and he has good posture for the rest of your life. <laughs> oh, yes. That's Steve Fiziog here of ESPN. <laughs> and I'm happily married. Two children. All right. Inside and low. Here's John Olroot at the plate. What an afternoon he has had. He's been on base three times. Home runs his first two times up, and he fly to center. Had he pulled the ball, he would have left the yard. He intentionally walked his last time, and now the count's gone three and zero. Green light here. And it is in there. Perfect spot. Three and one. He walked him. So Olerud has been on four times in this game, and now Joe Gray must work with Ed Sprague. One ball, no strikes to Sprague. This guy, you know, we talk about College World Series. Nobody has seen more excitement in that than the fellow to play at Sprague. He's been part of two College World Champions at Stanford, and then he won a World Championship in the Major Leagues last year with the Blue Jays. Hey, his wife won a gold medal in the Olympics in synchronized swimming. Sprague hits it a mile to right center field. Curtis racing back. It is gone. A home run for Ed Sprague and the fifth home run by the Blue Jays in this game. a typical day game home run in Anaheim California the wind blowing out to right center and the right handers hit him that spin just gets carried out and the ball just keeps on carrying and here is Darren Jackson the loneliest man in the Toronto lineup the only Blue Jay not to reach base it is now 10 to 4 Toronto in there a ball to strike much inside and skies in the air to Luis Bologna so Jackson goes over five but his team leads by six Mike Timlin is the new Toronto pitcher with the Blue Jays leading the Angels 10 4 and Timlin 6 4 210 pound right hander 27 years old from Midland Texas 4 1 8 is the earned run average they really like him very much as a very live arm Fred yeah he has a real exploding type fastball that really runs in tough on right handers his only problem been this year is getting left handers out he throws that slider and a running fastball but the left handers have had no problem with him so he needs to work on something to get those lefties out and the first man he will face is Gary D. Sarcina the California shortstop there's Turner Ward the new left fielder taking over for Joe Carter Joe a little more time off with a six run lead here in the bottom of the ninth inning. 
Imlin will face De Sarcina, Polonia, and then Chad Curtis. Toronto trying to push the record to 29 and 22. They started the afternoon tied with the New York Yankees for second place in the American League East, three games behind front running Detroit. And California was in first place with a record of 26 and 20. They led by three games. Texas has won. Charlie Liebrandt throwing a shot out over the Minnesota Twins. With what they have right now, Fred, and they're missing David Cohn and Jimmy Key from a year ago, who were part of that championship team. Do you think Toronto has what it takes to win the American League East? Well, I think they have it on paper if their starting pitching comes around. I mean, they've got Jack Morris and Dave Stewart, two veteran pitchers that hopefully sooner or later will get it together for them, give them the innings that they want out of those guys. They'll get Stoudemire back off the DL, and Henkin's been pitching very well for them. And if Leiter can do it as well, you know, they have the ingredients. And they just have to put it together. The infield hit for Gary D. Sarcina to start the bottom of the ninth inning. And there's such a fine organization, and Pat Gillick has given so much room with, to work with. It's a uh, chopper from D. Sarcina. Robbie Alomore again showing great range and I guarantee you not many guys in, in this league get to that ball and throw the ball as well. That's two nice throws Robbie's made from his knees. Here's Luis Polonia. Ball one. You know you just get the feeling uh, I was saying that if they're the all-star break and they have some needs, Pat Gillick will go out and find the people that are necessary to win a championship. Yeah, players love that. If they, if they know they're in the hunt, and they, like you say, if they need a pitcher here or an, a player or a role player, Gillick will go out and get it for them. I mean, that's nice to know when you're a player that your team, your management wants to win as much as you do. Here's a 2 0 pitch. And in. Three balls and no strikes to Polonia, and Timlin having a struggle with the strike zone. He has a six run lead to work with. That's just saying he just throws strikes. Those guys make mistakes. Side corner, three and one. California, they'll be improving themselves. They expect to get Kelly Gruber back very shortly. He's been rehabbing down at Triple A in Vancouver. And Polonia takes ball four. So Timlin starts the inning off, bottom of the ninth, in troublesome fashion. An infield single to De Sarcina and a walk to Polonia. Here comes Chad Curtis. Last time he was up in this situation, he grounded into a 6 4 3 double play. And that's when the Angels only trailed by four. Now they are down 10 to 4 in the bottom of the ninth inning. And Curtis swings and misses. Strike one. In this situation, I'm sure manager Cito Gasson would love to get it through this game without having to use Dwayne Ward. Right to Timlin, he goes to first and gets the double play. Yeah. 
Dee Arcina remains at second base, but the Angels down to their final out. Curtis hits a bullet this time, and I think even if Timlin had missed that ball, Robbie Alomar was standing right on second base. It would have been a double play either way, but tough break for Chad Curtis, who hits a ball right on the button. Nothing to show for it. Yeah, but if he turns and goes to second, with where Poloni was standing, he's got a chance for three. What a way to end the game. Yeah, Di Sarcino was way off the bag. He definitely had him as well. But he saw he saw Polonia so far off first, he went for the sure thing. He saw another out. Salmon checks his swing and a breaking ball, and he went around. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, let's keep moving, boys. You'll get no breaks I got a from the umpire. To go to. No breaks at this point in time. Hamburgers are just about done. The 1 1 pitch and Salmon bites it off his fist and drops it into right field rounding third coming home is De Sarcina. It is 10 to 5 Toronto. That's the advantage of being six foot two and 215 pounds. A good boring in fastball by Timlin but Salmon strong enough to muscle it over the head of Robbie Alomar. And a smaller guy, that's a little fly ball to second base. So Gary comes home with the Angels' fifth run. And here's Chili Davis. Wing and a miss. Chili, first time up, rocketed a single to right field, then grounded out, then single to center field, struck out his last time. So Chili, two for four. Bottom of the ninth inning. Tim Salmon has just driven in a run, his 32nd of the year. Chile going back to the on deck circle for some pine tar. Normally, umpires don't let you do that. You ask them for permission. You know, he, the, you can see the bat slip out of his top hand, which is very unusual. But the umpire, Tim Toshida, granted him permission. And the pitch is high. A ball and a strike. Baltimore's beaten Oakland 3 1. Davis fouls it back. A ball and two strikes. And now California down to their final strike. Salmon is at first base. Davis is the play with the count one and two. Excellent crowd watching this one better than 30,000. This is the first of a three game series with these Blue Jays. First place Angels in the West and the second place Blue Jays in the East. And the one two. Ground ball second base Alomar will go to first and this game is history. Toronto wins 10 to 5 over the California Angels. Kind of the game that we expected to see. A lot of runs produced. The Toronto Blue Jays score 10 runs again, just like they've been doing. And that man, John Olro, hit two of them. Two of the five Toronto home runs in this game. Jack Morris wins his third. John Farrell loses number six. For Fred Lynn, I'm Steve Fiziak. Saying good afternoon from Anaheim, California. Sports Center is coming your way next on ESPN. <laughs>